It's the 27th of February, 2023. It's 42 degrees in Turlock, California, and it is raining. And I'm going to talk about professional client relationships and some ways of understanding ethical issues related to them. Okay. If it's not okay, then stop watching. Um, at one point I asked some students in a class what were some desirable characteristics in a professional client relationship. And they came up with a list that I thought described characteristics desirable in any kind of relationship, um, more or less. Trust, open communication, respect. Um, we talked further about respect, and it turned out that what they meant was respect for the client's autonomy. In a you know, personal relationship, that would mean respect for one another and their choices. And then respect for professional expertise. Um, and then I pushed on that a little bit, and we started talking about whether that meant professional authority. And then we got into questions about professional power. Um, which I'm not going to talk too much about here, but it's an, an important issue. Um, well, I guess I will talk about power a little bit here. These are desirable characteristics in a professional client relationship and necessary to um, maintaining a reasonable way for professionals to serve clients' needs and for clients to get services that they need from professionals. So they can happen in different kinds of relationships. So I, I think being compassionate is a good characteristic to have with either my students or with my spouse. But I think it's obvious that it should lead to very different behavior and for very different reasons in those two relationships. Um, for instance, I, I rarely give my spouse a due date for something, and I frequently give my students due dates for things. Um, there is some discussion about whether or not due dates are a good idea in education, and um, I have my doubts about the value of due dates. Um, but, you know, they're there. They're something that people use, so... And they're not something that's really characteristic of personal relationships, you know. Um, compassion sure is. How can I be compassionate with a student? Well, you know, if you've had a particularly horrible semester and you've had COVID 16 times in the semester already and um, your, your favorite horse has... Um, also come down with COVID or at least a really bad hacking cough and you're very worried about her and um, in addition you've you've got a prized uh, poodle who loves to ride the horse and has been right off riding the horse because of the cough and so you can't take your horse and poodle out for shows where the poodle rides the horse around in a ring and um I might be compassionate with you. I might also be a little amazed that you do this. Um, but anyway, I might be compassionate with you for missing due dates if that is something that's been on your mind, et cetera, et cetera. So I might give you a break. So different relationships have very different bases or origins. They have different settings, purposes, orientations, and boundaries. And that's what we're going to be talking about. What I'm going to be talking about, you're just going to be sitting there listening or walking around listening or whatever you're doing. So for instance, the basis of our relationship, the origin of our relationship is you signed up for a class and now here you are. Or if you're just some rando who's looking things up on YouTube we don't really have a relationship other than that you happen to find this video. Hello. The setting of our relationship, for those of you who signed up for the class, is the university. The purpose in that case is that you need to fulfill a GE requirement, and here I am, etc., etc., etc. 
So um, there's a kind of classic essay in the um, professional ethics literature by a guy named Michael Bales, where he was trying to sort out what the professional client relationship should look like in terms of who should have greater authority and responsibility for decision making. I'm not sure why that was his focus, but that's what he did. Who should have greater authority and responsibility for decision making in the professional client relationship? Now, there are three basic permutations. Either the client has greater authority and responsibility than the professional, or the client and the professional are equal. And he called those possibilities of their being equal a contract, a collegial relationship, or a friendship. Or the client has less authority and responsibility to make decisions than the professional. Now, before I go into that last one, I'm going to talk about all three generally of the main permutations here. Now, if the client has greater authority and responsibility for making decisions than the professional, that means that the basic outline of the service being provided by the professional is determined by the client. That would mean that, for instance, you come to me as your instructor and essentially, you tell me what you're going to learn. You tell me how you're going to learn it. And then I find the ways that you're going to learn. Bales thought that didn't make much sense, neither as an ideal of the professional client relationship, nor as a realistic picture of the relationship. It's not a good ideal because the client wouldn't know enough about their situation to provide themselves with the service that they needed. And it's also just not realistic. It's not what happens in that relationship. If the client and professional are considered kind of equal, and this was happening in the 70s when he wrote this article, early 80s actually he wrote this article, um, there are other problems. Suppose we consider the relationship between the professional and the client, um, instructor and student, to be contractual. In that case, there would be something like a, a negotiation scene between us, where um, we can be regarded as having a give and take in our relationship that's on equal basis. The fact of the matter is, we're not on an equal basis. I have greater power in this relationship than you do, in large part because I know more about my field than you do. I know more about what you need to know about this field than you do. In addition, I've got more institutional power than you have. So as a contract, you're in a, a weaker position to be a good negotiator or an equal negotiator in that contract. So that's not a really a good idea to consider it a contractual relationship for the client's sake. Secondly, again, it's not realistic. That's not really how these relationships work. Collegial, same kinds of problems. A collegial relationship, Bale says, is one where the, the two parties work together towards the same goal. They share the goal and they work together towards that goal. In a way that sounds right, but in a sense, we don't share the same goal. Your goal might be different from my goal in this relationship. If our goals have to be the same, there could be some serious conflict. My goal in teaching classes is always to get across to students some important and interesting ideas that are philosophical. That's not always my students' goals. Often enough, my students' goals are to get through the semester with the least effort possible and the highest grade possible. I'm not saying they're wrong to do that. 
I'm saying that's what a lot of them do. That's not the same goal I have. If they operate with that goal and I have a different goal, we're going to have some serious conflict. Secondly, I'm not sure we have the same goal anyway, even if you really want to know more about philosophical ethics and professional ethics, because I want to teach it to you, not learn it from you. And even though I learn while teaching, and I always do, it's different from the kind of learning that you're doing. Yours is more fundamental. You're learning the basics of things. Your learning is ground level. I'm learning at a different level from you because of the background I already have, right? So it doesn't make much sense of what's really going on here. You go to the doctor because your health needs to be improved. The doctor's health doesn't need to be improved for you going to the doctor. That's one of Bales's examples. The third example of a equal relationship would be something like friendship. And this is the silliest one because we don't need to be friends. There doesn't need to be any kind of um, affection or affiliation between us. We could be friendly, but we don't need to be friends. And even if we are friendly, it's not primarily that purpose that this relationship is about. The relationship is a utilitarian relationship. It's a relationship that involves and is for the sake of providing a service to the client, not being friends. So again, it's not realistic and it's not ideal. Sometimes being friendly with a client or a student or a patient, etc., can be a problem, as you'll see when you read the Pertinelli, Young, and Taylor essay. I had this happen with a student, in fact. Um, I had a student who took a class. He was an older student. He was really interesting. He'd been, um, he was a veteran. He'd been a businessman, and he was a returning student. He'd always been interested in philosophy, and he decided, um, after his business career was basically over, he decided to come back to college and buy gum, get his philosophy degree that he was always kind of interested in. And that's what he did. It was really kind of cool. He had a very different perspective on things. And, well, after one semester taking my class, we just we started hanging out together and reading stuff together and things like that. But then he took another class from me. And that was trouble. That semester, it was really difficult for me to be objective in evaluating his papers. And I'm pretty sure that I graded him more harshly out of a kind of... Um, a little bit of fear that I was going to be lenient. And I think that he kind of got a little rankled about it too, because he saw that I was grading him a little harshly. It strained our friendship, and it also strained our relationship as instructor and student. It was a bad idea to be that friendly with him, in that case at least. Um, all right, so. If the client doesn't have greater authority and responsibility for decision-making than the professional, and if it doesn't make sense for the client and professional to be equal, there's only one option left. The client has less authority and responsibility for decision-making than the professional does. And there's two, I, two ideas or two ways that that could be so. One is paternalism. And Bales defines paternalism as the professional making decisions for the client. The client just doesn't make any decisions. That clearly is not what goes on in professional client relationships, so we can just sort of dump that aside. And the one that he decides to go with is what he calls fiduciary. He takes the term fiduciary from the world of finance. A fiduciary in finance is a person who seeks the best financial interest of their client. And so it's a specific, narrowly focused interest that the professional has. They seek that interest alone for the client and only that. So that idea of a narrow focused only on that particular 
service or need of the client is something that Bales was aiming for by calling it a fiduciary. So that's why fiduciary is the most important or the best model according to Bales. It's narrow. It doesn't depend on something like friendship or collegiality. It's not contractual. The fiduciary knows better how to serve the client's interests than the client knows because the fiduciary professional has the background knowledge, the ins and outs knowledge to be able to get the thing done that the client doesn't know. Next thing I want to talk about is role differentiation and the crossing over of roles. Daily social life is complicated. You know, we have multiple roles in life. Um, a role um, is dependent on a certain kind of function. It has certain kind of responsibilities and expectations. Sometimes it even has a certain kind of uniform or way of dressing. We switch between different roles all the time. A role is not an identity. Um, an identity is a source of meaning, a fundamental source of meaning in life. And a role is a function that you perform in life, a, a certain set of responsibilities. Um, role is nice because if you think about an actor playing a role, um, they play a role. It's not that they are the role. Even a method actor shouldn't think of themselves as being the role. That's, that's being too identified with the role. So um, my role as an instructor is something that I ought to be able to pick up and put down. I should be able to set aside my function, my responsibility, and the expectation that I am explaining concepts, that I'm explaining philosophical ideas. I ought to be able, at some point in my life, to set that aside and go roast a chicken or, you know, I'm going to roast a chicken later today, I hope. And I really hope that I don't try to explain role differentiation to the chicken. Um, it's going to be a dead chicken for one thing and dead chickens and even live chickens really aren't going to pay much attention to role differentiation in the first place. So, And I ought not, I think I ought not to continue trying to be an instructor to my spouse. That's a good way to get some flack. You know this already. You know that sometimes when your roles get kind of juggled in your mind, you can sometimes, you know, commit a little faux pas. You can accidentally play the wrong role in a different setting and hilarity ensues. Sometimes a profession can feel like an identity. Um, my role as an instructor, I want to distinguish from my profession as a philosopher. I think I'm kind of always a philosopher, which may not be a profession anyway. Um, for me, being a philosopher is definitely a fundamental way that I make meaning in my life. Um, it's definitely not just a role. I'm always a philosopher. I'm going to be philosoph philosophical about roasting the chicken. There's no question in my mind about it. I'm not going to try to teach the chicken anything, but I'm going to be philosophical about roasting the chicken. Because um, I'm, philosophical, I'm philosophical about brushing my teeth, for crying out loud about flossing, um, more about flossing than brushing. Anyway, so a professional role, like a role of the client, like a role of just a ordinary person just walking down the street, etc., have different functions, different responsibilities, different, different expectations. So if we take that idea of role differentiation, we can think about the ethical responsibilities of professionals as being attached to their roles. So you pick up ethical responsibilities when you take on the role of a professional. I have ethical responsibilities to my students 
as my student's instructor. I don't have responsibilities to them in, in a general way as just a person other than the responsibilities I have to anybody else. I don't have to be an instructor to them on off hours, on times when I'm not their instructor. For instance, when the semester ends, I don't have to be their instructor anymore. Um, you know, within certain limitations. When I'm roasting the chicken, I don't have to be your instructor. So how does role differentiation help explain ethical responsibilities? There's a few different possibilities. One way is to consider that ethical responsibilities in your professional role are completely separate from ethical responsibilities in your personal life. This is sometimes called absolute role differentiation. A very old article that is sometimes used in professional ethics and business ethics textbooks, uh, I think from like 1968, um, what's the guy's name? It makes the case anyway that um, business is business and personal life is where morality belongs. Once you enter the business world, morality is set aside. It's, you know, it's dog eat dog in the business world. This has certain problems, among which is whether or not it's psychologically plausible for human beings to just switch off morality in that way. But taking it a slightly different way, could it be that personal life ethical responsibilities have nothing whatsoever to do with ethical responsibilities in the workplace? Here's a more sophisticated version of that kind of really hard and fast role differentiation. It comes from a very important uh, U.S. philosopher named Thomas Nagel, no relation to me. I do call him Uncle Tom sometimes, but that's just a terrible joke. In an article that he wrote called Ruthlessness in Public Life, which is a really cool title, uh, and it's a cool article too, uh, he talks about um, public officials and government officials lying to the public for the good of the public and interesting stuff like that. I'll try to explain his argument. It's complicated. He was a tough philosopher in these ways. His arguments were always complicated. He says something like this. Um, and I drew a diagram to try to explain it. So what this diagram depicts is if you take that, that rectangle, that rounded rectangle, as the entire universe of morality, right? All of the moral actions possible. So personal life morality and public or professional life morality are separate spheres within that whole universe of moral life. So there is a morality that belongs to personal life, but there's also a morality that belongs to professional life. There's, they're both part of morality, but they're separate spheres of morality. There have to be moral reasons why something is moral in personal life. And there have to be moral reasons for things to be moral in professional life or in public life. For the government official to lie to the public, there has to be a moral reason for it. For a person to lie in personal life, there would need to be a moral reason for it. And Nagel says that's a harder rationale to come up with. Personal life morality seems to us to be more like morality as a whole seems to us. Professional life seems to us to have certain kinds of wiggle room. But what he ends up arguing is, it's not like that at all. It's that the reasons why in professional life are just different than the reasons why in personal life. It's still moral. There's still moral things at stake. They're just very different. Remember what I said about being compassionate to students. That'll help it, that example will help explain what he's talking about here. So I said, 
Being compassionate with my spouse in personal life has a very different meaning, a very different purpose than it does being compassionate with my students in my professional life. The reason I have to be compassionate with my spouse has to do with my relationship with my spouse, which is an ongoing relationship. My purpose in being compassionate has to do with the relationship itself. It doesn't need any further purpose. It doesn't need any further rationale behind it. I should be compassionate because of the relationship. When it comes to being compassionate to students, there is a, a reason having to do with their being students and a purpose having to do with helping my students learn well. So the rationale for compassion is very different. The setting is very different. It has a purpose. Now, I'm not saying I shouldn't be compassionate in a general way, but it might be inappropriate. If in my personal life, my spouse has something going on in her personal life, like with her brother or with her, her friends, that's really upsetting her, there's certain things that are appropriate for me to do. You know, give her a hug, talk to her about this thing going on in her life. It would be not appropriate for me to do that with students. I hope that helps explain the difference. Personal life morality, when it comes to being compassionate with my spouse, is about the open-endedness of that relationship. And being compassionate with students in my professional life is about the narrow scope of my purpose and my students' purpose in our relating to each other in that context, in that professional client relationship context. I hope you kind of get that. That's kind of the best I can give you on that today, anyway. Then there's a different model that comes to us from a business professor from, um, I think she teaches at Harvard still. I mean, where do you go from Harvard? Um, her name is Laura Nash. I think she's still cooking. I think she's still with us. Um, she suggests integrating personal life morality and professional morality. Now, she's a business professor, so uh, a business ethics professor. So when we're talking about professional life, she means business life. Now, she was pretty deep into this. So what she's saying is um, kind of like Thomas Nagel's assumption that there's a sort of morality as a whole. Within morality as a whole, there are kind of separate spheres of personal life, morality, values, religious values, too, for those that have those. And then there's professional or public life, your business life, etc., and the moral values that apply to that. Well, what Nash began to argue for starting in the late 80s and early 90s was that some of our personal life values really should integrate with our professional lives to kind of um, to serve to kind of soften the hard edge of the way business is practiced. It's really kind of the opposite of that hard and fast absolute role differentiation. In other words, Nash was arguing that instead of totally separating morality from business, that we really ought to practice business in a way that reflects our personal moral values. And that that's not just good for us as people and good for us as um, moral people, but that she could show that it's good business practice, good ethical business practice as well. It certainly helps people avoid legal problems. So 
in my uh, little sort of Venn-like diagram, there's a um, place of intersection between personal life morality and personal, and sorry, and professional life morality. And that intersection of personal and professional, you see, I made it purple between the two, the, the blue and the red there. It's purple, kind of mauve. Uh, in that, pers- that intersection of personal and professional, that's sort of the sweet spot. That's where you really want to be, according to Laura Nash. That's where you're integrated between your personal life and your professional life. Um, I'll give you an example of this. Um, it's a maybe this will work, maybe this won't work. Maybe I'll fall flat on my face. I've done that before, so nothing new. Imagine that uh, I was asked to teach a course that involved having to make a decision about whether I was going to teach something that I had a, a real personal stake in. Um, the example that comes to mind is the I think I think it's in the uh, the, the course introduction. Um, I have a deep personal stake in um, the death penalty. I think that I, I can't accept it. I think that it's wrong on so many levels. Um, I don't need to go into the argument about it. Uh, what Laura Nash is suggesting is that my personal moral value, that I think the death penalty is wrong, that I ought to let my professional life be guided by my personal moral value. In other words, my practice of my profession, philosophy instructor, should be guided by that. To me, that suggests that if I have an opportunity to teach something in which that could be relevant, that I ought to let those values become part of what I teach in the course. Here's an example that Laura Nash used uh, later on. This is in the, about 2010, she made this argument, I think. Um, She published an article in which she argued that um, people should set aside at their workstations um, little places for religious iconography to represent their religious beliefs. And she said that people should set aside time in their work days for religious observance, thus integrating their religious life with their business life. So that's what she's suggesting by this integration of personal and professional morality. That could be problematic for a number of reasons, I think. I've tried to indicate just by my examples, uh, mine and hers, what those might turn out to be. I'm not going to go into why I think those are problematic. Just let yourself... Think through the implications of it. Finally, um, just an example that you'll see, or not an example, a, um, a idea or concept that you'll see in Pertinelli, Young, and Taylor's article is about boundary crossing and boundary violation. Kind of what we're talking about with um, with the idea of role differentiation is boundaries. Um, What I needed with my student who had become kind of a friend was a boundary, a clear boundary that both of us understood and respected and had a clear bead on. We didn't really set out what that boundary was. Boundaries are hard for lots of people. Um, Boundary crossing, if I, as I understand the Pertinelli Young and uh, and Taylor article is what happens when professionals behave towards clients in ways that are outside of their normal roles. They're, they're saying something personal or they're doing something personal. I do this a lot. I tell personal stories. Um, I mentioned roasting a chicken earlier. 
That's boundary crossing. Because I'm saying something that's personal. I used it as an example, but it's still a boundary crossing because it's a personal detail. Um, I've mentioned uh, my own mental health issues. That's boundary crossing. I use my experiences of dealing with HMOs as a person with mental health issues as examples of how shitty HMOs are sometimes. Okay, all the time. But that's still boundary crossing. Right? I'm doing it as a way of explaining a concept in professional ethics, but it is boundary crossing. I'm not doing it just to talk about my troubles with my students and try to get them to talk about their troubles and have a big kind of therapy session. That's not what I'm doing, but it's still a boundary crossing. Is it a boundary violation? Well, boundary violation occurs when boundary crossing is or is perceived as harmful. When does that happen? Well, unfortunately, we don't know until it happens. Yikes. So, oh, this is a standard informed consent notice. Um, you can take a look at that at your leisure. Uh, I hope that this presentation gives you some basic um, beginning for understanding professional client relationships. Um, I will put the slides up so that you can use them to go through and um, have the words in front of you again and look things over. Ciao.